Good evening and welcome to Holy Comforter Episcopal School. My name is Peter Kleekamp. I am the head of school and I am thrilled to welcome all of our families and those of you that might be visiting our school for the first time. We are incredibly excited and proud of our lecture series event. Uh, but before we introduce our featured speaker, there are a couple of others that you're going to hear from. And first, who's going to lead us in singing the national anthem? Taylor Stevens, an eighth grader of Holy Comforter. Taylor? Thank you, Taylor. Three years ago, we came up with the concept of creating a lecture series. And the mission of that lecture series is to create opportunities for all of us to be able to learn from featured speakers, nationally recognized. This past six months, we were able to create a partnership with Hancock Bank. And because of Hancock Bank's financial generosity, we were able to bring in from people from all over the country. And right now, I'd like to invite Chip Cicchetti, who is not only a parent, of students here at Holy Comforter, but also the Vice President of Hancock Bank. Chip? Thank you, Peter. Um, I can't sing a cappella, so hopefully you'll bear with me. Uh, good evening. I am Chip Chiquetti. I'm a Vice President at Hancock Bank, and we're extremely proud to be the presenting sponsor of the uh, Holy Comforter Lecture Series. As a dad, as Peter's indicated, of two children here, I'm especially proud that my employer sees the benefit of providing these type of forums for all of our children, not just those in the Holy Comfort family. So thank you, Peter, and the board and the staff for having the vision and the foresight to bring this to us this evening. Um, I was asked to be brief, so I'll do my best to keep on the task here. In conclusion, I would note that Hancock Bank, along the lines of our uh, speaker this evening, has a story to tell as well. Um, I'd like to think we've made the, most of the comp made the most of the opportunities that we've been presented as well. When I joined the bank six years ago, we were a small, two-state, $3 billion bank. Six years later, we're five states and $20 billion. I'd like to think that my tenure there coincides with that, had a lot to do with it, but they may not agree with me. Um, we, we do accomplish this, though, by coming to work every day and trying to help people achieve their goals and dreams through our honor, strength, stability, teamwork, and responsibility as, as the code and the credo that we live by. And we're just very, very pleased and proud to be partnered with an organization like Holy Comforter that embodies those same things and is trying to teach our children and to make the community better. So thank you for your commitment for being here tonight. And we hope that you make the most of what happens with, to you tonight. Thank you.
I had the pleasure in introducing our featured speaker, and I started looking at a variety of different ways that I could do this. Uh, and fortunately or unfortunately for you, I have to share a childhood story. Um, and it's going to go back to the one day throughout the year that I could not, I did not want it to happen. It was the one day that I despised it coming up, and that one day was when my mother said, we're going to be seeing the dentist next week. And you might be going, well, why would that be? Well, my dentist, his name was Dr. Fear, F-E-H-R, and he, he, he did live up to that name. Um, and whether you know this or not, I have seven siblings. And for some reason or another, my mother wanted to hold on to that same dentist that she had an hour away uh, that she thought her children should suffer or experience. Um, and so all nine of us, eight kids with my mother driving, would make the hour trek to go see our dentist. Now, going and seeing Dr. Fear, not only did you pull in the parking lot, but then you had to go up this narrow staircase that was dark paneled, and you just had all eight of us in tears before we even hit the office. We sat in line, one by one by one, next, next, next. Each person coming out, their jaw was about six inches lower than when it came in. Well, you might go on, well, why the dentist story? Well, there was one thing that I kept my focus on while I sat in that chair. And it was typically a picture. And it was a picture of this far off place that many of you have seen in doctor's offices with these amazing quotes. And I would focus on that wishing that I could teletransport myself there versus sitting in that chair. Well, I started going through Chris Waddell's One Rotation website. And it's pretty amazing. You look at the things that he has accomplished and the list is truly inspiring a gifted athlete, someone who has been recognized by the Dalai Lama. My wife did notice the one that he is one of the 50 most beautiful people by People magazine as well. Well, and then I started looking at the different pictures that Chris was a part of, and Chris was in for one revolution. In the first slide, life is fluid. If we can remove the emotional resistance to change, we can embrace it. As I shared this slide with our children in chapel the other day, I said, you guys are much better at this than us adults. But we also know that the, through the story of Chris, we can all embrace change. The next slide. The journey is all that's guaranteed. This is not a dress rehearsal. And his message to our students earlier today was to embrace life as it comes to you and go with it. And the next slide. Nobody climbs a mountain alone. This is a community. We are blessed to be in this community, and we know the importance of being able to rely on the community that each and every one of you are surrounded by. And the last, which is the theme for tonight's talk, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. I am blessed and honored to introduce our fe featured speaker, Mr. Chris Waddell. Thank you, Peter. Thanks very much. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. I've spent a great day here today. And it's, it's just been a lot of fun to be able to interact with the students. I did a presentation. I think I went to, I might have visited all of the students in the classrooms as we went along. No, not all of them. Okay. A, a lot of them. Okay. All right, good, but it was, a lot, it was a lot of fun and it's been great and it's been great to feel like a little bit of a part of your community, just being able to meet a lot of you, which to me is something that's so important. As Peter mentioned, the theme of what I want to talk about is it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. Because no matter who we are, no matter how successful we are, no matter how smart we are, no matter how strong we are, no matter how rich we are, something's going to happen, isn't it? That cuts us to the bone, that forces us to, to question a lot of the decisions that we've ever made and a lot of things that we've assumed about ourselves. And the thing is, if we can remove this emotional part of it, we can move forward and we can embrace this sense of change because change is the only thing that's really ultimately guaranteed, isn't it? The thing about it is that, that on one side we want to be secure and on the other side we want to learn and grow and dream and never really grow old. And the thing is, this side's a bit of a, a, bit of a mirage, whereas this side if we continue to say, oh, well, things are going to go wrong and now it's up to me to find a way to get them to go right, then we're moving forward. So, 
I am going to show, I hope you don't mind, I got into this a little bit, but I want to show just a short little video that the kids saw today, and then I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about Kilimanjaro, and I will talk a little bit more about this. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do, it's what happens to you. So hopefully, we are all set. Okay. There we go. I feel like almost to be fair to the kids that we should that we should go through the exercise that we did today with the kids, right? Do you think we should do this with the it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you? So what we did is we actually broke the room in half and we had one side chant, it's not what happens to you, and the other side answered. So maybe what we can do is we can have those of you in the front say it's not what happens to you, and those of you in the back will answer with it's what you do with what happens to you. Think this will work? I ain't gonna work. Okay. All right, you ready? I'll count to three. One, two, three. Exactly. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. And part of the reason that I, put a, that I put the video up there is because sometimes I talk about skiing and people look at me like, so how does this work? So at least with the video, now you have a picture of how this works. You don't think that I'm completely delusional, which might be true, but just not necessarily in this case. So anyway, the idea of it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. Let me tell you just a quick story of what it means to me in that a few years ago I was in Tibet and it was a long way from home. The kids have already heard this story. But when I came home it took forever to get home. It took 16 hours driving over this bumpy dirt, these bumpy dirt roads just to get into China. Then I had to flew ha fly halfway across the world. And when I got home I wanted to see what I'd missed. So I went to my mailbox and my mailbox is not in front of my house. It's at the end of my street this collective mailbox. So I drove my car up to it, parked my car, started pulling my chair out. I'm putting the wheels on. This little girl rode up. She's like six years old on her little pink bike, pink streamers coming off the handlebars. And she said, what happened to your legs? Now, I've just flown halfway across the world. I'm tired. I don't really feel like having a conversation with a six-year-old. But the thing is, there are 1.1 billion people in the world with physical disabilities. 
according to the WHO. It's a really big number, like one in six, one in seven people. And the thing is, from the time we're little, we're taught not to stare at somebody who, look, who looks different. And if we never get a chance to look, if we never get a chance to ask questions, we never get a chance to know somebody who seemingly is different from us, but probably shares a whole lot more in common. So I felt like I had to answer the little girl's question as best I could, so I told her that I was a ski racer in college. It was my first day of Christmas vacation. I went home, my brother and I went to our home mountain. We met up with a bunch of friends, took a couple of runs before we were gonna train, and in the middle of a turn, my ski popped off. And I fell in the middle of the trail, didn't hit anything but the ground, and it broke two vertebrae, damaged the spinal cord. I tried to describe it in ways that she could understand it. I said, you know those little bumps on your back? Well, those are bones, and those bones protect the nerves, and the nerves take the message from the brain to the rest of the body, and because I broke two of those bones, it's like cutting a power cord. So now the message doesn't go from my brain to my legs or my legs back. And I don't know how well I'm doing, but apparently I'm doing pretty well. She said, so you'll never walk again. And I said, no, probably not. And she rode away, and as she rode away, she said, well, that's too bad. And I wish that I had stopped her because if I'd never had my accident, I never would have been the best in the world at anything. I was the best monoskier in the world. That's an amazing gift to be the best in the world at something, but it came out of this tragedy. It wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had my accident. And to me, that's what, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you, means, and it's part of the reason that I decided I wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, because I felt like I had a bigger voice. By virtue of what I had done athletically, I felt like I had a little bit more of a voice than other people. And, and I felt like I could, I could create a light that would, show, that would show what we could really do. So I decided one day that I wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And I told people that I wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I think this is the, the, uh, the cautionary tale of choose your friends wisely. Because I told my friends and none of them disabused me of the idea. They're like, oh yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, you should climb a 19,000 foot mountain. That seems like a great idea for you. You should do that. No one other than my father who said, I don't know what to make of most of your ideas. I wish you'd just get a job then I won't have to worry about you. <laughs> yes, exactly. and for some reason I didn't hear him. I don't know why that was, but I didn't hear him. And, but, the, but my friends, they all said, yes, you should do it. And then the next question was, are you ready? And my answer was, I will tell you when I'm done whether I was ready. Because you don't know what might happen on the mountain. Things can go wrong and you have no idea. To illustrate this point, back in 1953, uh, Hillary had made it to the top of Everest. First guy to make it to the top of Everest, first guy to make it to the top of Everest and come back down at least. I mean, who knows if Mallory actually made it or not. But Hillary went up and was able to t say that he actually made it to the top, had the pictures and everything to prove it. And then, and then uh, there was this... this med student who was training on his lunch hour and the gremlins are back. He was training on his, on his lunch hour. We can power through this, right? It's not what happens to you, it's what you do, it's what happens to you. This is it. Okay. Good, good, good. So anyway, so there was this med student who was training on his lunch hour and he was doing a lot of stress testing on himself. He was preparing to try to break the four minute mile and he was using himself as a guinea pig, but he said to his crew, he said, we should bring in Hillary, we should bring this, in this guy who went to the top of the world. Like, let's test this guy. And they tested Hillary, and at the end of the day, um, Roger Bannister said to Hillary, in sort of typical British fashion, he said, I don't know how you did it. Because he tested completely average. There was nothing physically spectacular about him, but what was spectacular about him was that he took one more step when somebody else wouldn't. That he found a way to solve those problems along the way that other people couldn't find a way to do it. And the thing is, on the mountain, things go wrong right from the beginning. This is us at the gate at about 6,000 feet. We haven't started. My biggest challenge is going to be getting to camp on time. Now camp, there are huts on the route that we used. About 3,300 feet of vertical, 1,000 meters about 9.3 miles in distance, so 15K kind of thing. And, and this is when we did a scouting trip, it took me four days to get to the second camp. 
When we did the scouting trip, I thought, you know what? It'll just be easier. It'll be cheaper. Let's just roll up to the top now. Like we're here, we should just do it. And they were pulling me by the end of the second day because I was not going fast enough to make this happen. We had planned, we'd changed our vehicle. I thought we could make it to camp on time. I got up early, I shaved for the last time in eight days. Took a shower, I'm ready, I'm ready to go, and it's taking forever to process our passports. I'm like, come on, let's go, we're burning daylight. Finally we get going. Now the vehicle that I used kind of looks like a Mars rover. It's like a Mars rover married to arm pedal power. You can kind of see right here, there's a little chest pad, and I lean my chest on this, and by leaning left and right, I can keep pedaling, and I can steer by, with my chest as I'm going up. It's a pretty ingenious kind of thing. I can't take credit for creating it by any means, but it's an ingenious kind of thing. And the, we built two vehicles. The first vehicle we built, we called Bomba, which in Swahili means cooler than cool, which seemed really appropriate. I broke Bomba right before we were supposed to leave. Broke it right at the T-tube, right there. And so we built a new one. And Dave, who's in this picture with me, he and his crew were working literally 24-7 to build a brand new vehicle. They built it. We put these wide wheels on it that are like four inches wide. They're designed, it, they're designed for riding a bicycle on the, on the snow. And it kind of looked like a monster truck. And I don't have a lot of Swahili vocabulary, but we called this one Kubwa. And Kubwa means huge because that's the way it looked. This is my first day on Kubwa. As you can see, I am still on the pavement at the bottom. We're still in the parking lot. We haven't actually done anything yet. And I'm already in first gear. And I'm a little bit concerned that I'm already in first gear and we're on the pavement. And Dave is there and I'm saying, Dave, I'm in big trouble. This mountain is going to get steeper. This mountain is going to get looser and I'm already in first gear. I'm in big trouble. And Dave has a bit of a Zen mentality. And he said, well, Let's just see how it goes. And I guess I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a willing conspirator at this point. I'm like, okay, well, let's see how it goes. Now, interesting, we were talking in one of the classrooms. They were doing a study on Kilimanjaro, and there are five different climate zones in Kilimanjaro. You start in a rainforest. You go through the heathers, the moors, the high desert, and you finish on an Arctic climate zone on the glacier at the top, which is pretty amazing when you think three degrees south of the equator, there's snow on the top, and there still is some snow on the top. As you can see here, we are, on in, the, we are in the rainforest. Now, the first 2,000 feet, we're actually on what they call the Porter's Road. This is a dirt road. And when we brought Bomba over to see if we could pull, a tri pull the trigger on making it to camp on time, we went up the Porter's Road. And that morning, I woke up and I asked Dave how long he thought it would take me to get up the Porter's Road, up the first 2,000 feet of vertical. And Dave said he thought it would take three hours. Now, I'm slightly competitive, and that was a bit of a challenge to me. I said, okay, yeah, three hours, that sounds like a good idea. So on Bomba, I did it in two hours and 42 minutes. And we decided, okay, this is cool, we can do it. Yeah, 18 minutes under, okay, this is good. On Kubwa, this thing, I don't have a low, I don't think I have a low enough gear. I did it in an hour and 57 minutes. I was like, oh, okay, this vehicle is pretty good. It's good. It's going to work out well. Now, the thing about that was that was the easy part. That was in some ways the warm-up. Afterwards, we ended up on these rock gardens and baby heads. Remember, we talked about that a little bit today. And they look like they're little, the rocks look like they're little baby heads in the ground. I did not make this up. I don't take any authorship of any of this. I know it's slightly politically incorrect, but it looks really, it, they really look like baby heads. And you would step over these baby heads. For me, it's the strategy of rock climbing where I've got to find my route with like the ballistic movement of trials bike riding where I'm just getting from here to there. People said, oh, you climbed a 19,000 foot mountain. That must have been beautiful. I was like, really? Because the view didn't change at all. <laughs> the view didn't change at all. I'm right here. And you can see we put a sailing winch on the front and we, and we attached the sailing winch to my cranks and what we were doing was I could pedal, they'd fix the rope, I could pedal and I could pull myself up because the vehicle is fixed axle rear wheel drive. So if we got on stuff that was loose, I would effectively just dig a hole. So with this, what I could do is I could pull myself up. The problem was the sailing winch company kept saying, oh yeah, we'll send you a winch, we'll send you a winch. We got it three days beforehand. I tried it once. When we did this, the gears started to grind, it started to heat up, it got really hard. Again. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. There has to be a plan B, a little bit less elegant,
but the plan B were eight foot long two by eight boards. And so we bridged the gaps. I love this photo for the look on Dave's face. Dave is right there. The look on his face is saying, yeah, yeah, this is good, but don't break anything. If you break something, we're in big, really big trouble. You can also see how the vehicle works where the wheels are on different planes. It's hinged in the middle. Each wheel would move as much as 14 inches independently. We make it to Mendera Hut in six and a half hours. I do not mind telling you at this point, I'm kind of cocky. I really am. I really am. I think this is great. Like I'm fit. The vehicle is working. We are just going to roll right up to the top. This is awesome. Now, we had a thousand more feet left in the rainforest when we finished, or in the beginning of the next day. We finished, and when we came out of the rainforest, it was like leaving this room. It was one step you're in the rainforest, and next step you're out of the rainforest. And when we left, we saw the mountain for the first time. So remember this little skull cap of snow here. We will revisit that later, hopefully. And, but things went wrong every single day, and what went wrong the second day was that they had they hadn't received their rainy season. So it was exploding dust. So somebody would take a step and it would just be poof, and it'd be really dirty for you, you'd just be dirty. For me, I'm at exhaust level. It's not black lung disease, it's more like brown snot disease. You know those ones you touch your nose and you're like, oh, that really hurts, yeah, exactly. This is what's going on, it's a whole lot worse with all of the people in our crew and they're moving rocks and it's dirty. I am still on the boards as we're going along. Now, I don't know if any of you were scarred the way that I was as a child, but we did a lot of road trips. And when you're in the backseat of the road trip as a kid, what do you want to do? You want to stop and eat, right? You want to eat. And my father was famous for saying, I know a great place, and it's right around the next corner. <laughs> oh, it's right around the next corner. Oh, it's right around. And I'm feeling cocky still at this point. I am thinking the hut is right around the next corner. And you can see it's starting to get dark. And they say every day on the summer, every day on the mountain is summer, and every night is winter. So when it gets dark, it gets cold. And it started to get dark, and it started to get cold. And Dave said, we can mark the spot right here. We'll push you up to the top, and then you can start here tomorrow. And obviously he knew exactly what would motivate me. And I wanted no part of him pushing me up to the hut and starting back down the mountain. No, no, no. So I picked up the pace, and I finished in complete darkness. Dark, cold, and really, really dirty. The beauty on the mountain is that you get to retire to the comfort of the hut. This is like five-star accommodations. It's awesome. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. My wheels touched on both sides of the doors as we were getting there. This was actually the most accessible part of the actual camps. I won't get into the outhouse that had been there since 1921. I mean, literally a monument of poo. It was, yes. This is the glamorous part. This is the romantic part of why you do this stuff. And the next morning we woke up and I am on the limit right now of what I can ride. But apparently I'd instilled a bit of confidence in the porters because they were gone. Those guys carrying the boards, they were gone. Yeah, they're like, oh, you're, you're good. And I'm like, I'm just barely making it. Now my team, I hope you can see this one. You can kind of see over here. We did a documentary film on the climb and my team is stopping and they're having lunch. After finishing in the dark, the day, the day before, I said, uh-uh, there's no way I am, fin I am getting out of this thing. I'm not stopping for lunch. I'm getting whatever I can out of a little goo pack. I am going to keep going. Now, you can also see that there's a bit of a road down there. And I was looking forward to this road. I knew that this road was there. And I get on this road, and a guy who had been one of my fraternity brothers in college, who's the chair of my board now, was with me. And I said to Bob, I said, you see those trekkers up there? And he said, yeah. And I said, we're going to go catch them. And he said, okay, that's fine. Didn't really affect him at all. Now, I picked it up from two miles an hour to two and a half miles an hour. And I am flying. I mean, I am literally, I am going so fast. This is, I am flying. And, but if you do the math, that's a 25% increase. Like, that's pretty significant, right? We have some bankers here, right? You guys are doing the math there. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, it's 25% increase, and we catch the trekkers. And they look at me and go, wow, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I think I mentioned I'm slightly competitive. I'm thinking, I'm kicking your butt. <laughs> Got to take the victories wherever you can get them at this point. They were the only people I caught. Now, 25,000 people a year attempt to climb Kilimanjaro. And there's about a 50% success rate. 
But the people who are successful, it is, they are euphoric and they're coming down. Some of them are coming down the mountain as we're going up the mountain. And they're euphoric and they're like, that is the hardest thing that I've ever done. They got slightly quiet when they got around me for some reason. But it forced me to think about this as I can see the cone. Now, I mentioned the first three days were 3,300 feet of vertical in 15K. The last day was going to be 4,200 feet of vertical in 5K. 900 more feet, a third of the distance. That triangle got a whole lot steeper, right? This is the way that hypotenuse there. And, and so this is my moment of reflection, though, where I had to say, was this the hardest thing that I've ever done? It took us two years to get to the mountain, two years of training, because I was a ski racer and a wheelchair racer. I raised wheelchair racing as effectively like running. I didn't really do any international competition that lasted longer than two minutes. I had to go from two minutes to nine hours a day. We had to raise the money to make this happen. We started doing this in 2008. I'm assuming some of you remember 2008. It was a fairly difficult time to raise any money. And so a lot of this was on my credit cards at this point, which uh, you know, was really very challenging. Uh, so we're doing this and, and, uh, and then also we had to develop this vehicle and I'm thinking, I thought, of, I thought of quitting a lot in the two years leading up to getting to the mountain, but I never thought of quitting while I was on the mountain. So was it the hardest thing I ever did? No, the hardest thing I ever did was getting there, was just getting this opportunity to try to climb the mountain. Now, you can see in this one that we're above the clouds. I did hope, or at least above some of the clouds, I did hope that it would get easier. I titled this slide, It's Just Right There. <laughs> and I'm like, uh-huh, right. And how long is it going to take me to get just right there? Well, I did make it there. This is Kibo Hut, 15,500 feet, and this is where it's going to happen. This is where we're going to see if we can actually climb the mountain. It took three days to feel like we were actually on the mountain, but this is really on the mountain. We get up with daylight put the winch on, and the winch doesn't work again. So after two years of preparation, I feel like I am staring defeat in the face that this is it. There's nothing we can do. And I think, I don't care. I'm going to do absolutely positively whatever I can. These guys are going to have to peel me off the mountain. I'm going to go as hard as I can. Because the thing was, I, I had a goal to try to shine a light on the, on the ability of these 1.1 billion people with physical disabilities. I wanted to spread doubt. I wanted people to see us differently. To not say, oh, that's too bad, like that little girl, but to say, well, what do you do? And I rode on the power of those 1.1 billion people. That gear that I didn't think I had a low enough gear, I kept clicking this thing over. Just kept clicking it over. It was out of body, and the only thing I can attribute it to is that I rode on their power. If it had been about me, I probably would have quit. I would have quit, but if it had been, but it was about them, and I just kept going. And it's about to get a little steeper. So this is on the scree field at about, about 17,500 feet, 10 inches of pea gravel, and I'm on the boards. And the problem is that I keep slipping off of these boards because nothing is flat. They haven't exactly manicured this mountain for me. Yeah, I mean, I really wish they would smooth it out a little bit, but I keep slipping off of these boards. And each time I slip off of the board, it's this mad sprint to try to get back up onto the board so that then I can start over again. To draw an analogy, ima imagine that you've decided that you want to run a marathon. And you go out and you train for this marathon and you know what you're supposed to do, you know, how many minutes per mile you're going to run and you're doing everything. And then in the middle, there's a sadistic course worker who diverts you momentarily. You're running along and he says, yeah, yeah, I know you're running, but what you have to do right now is you have to go up this embankment that's on the side of the road and it's covered in just greasy mud. And so you scramble madly up this thing, heart rate goes through the roof, and then he says, okay, now good, you can go back to your race. Now this is what it felt like for me each time I slipped off of the board and tried to get back onto the board, that it was just this mad sprint. Needless to say, I'm a little bit tired now, my organization is called One Revolution, and the mission of One Revolution is to turn perception of disability upside down. 
Kilimanjaro was an opportunity to do that, to turn it upside down. Now, the, the name One Revolution came from trekking, where anybody who's done any trekking, and I know there are a few of you out there, you do what's called a rest step, where they, you take one step, because there are a lot of things you can't do at altitude that you can do at sea level. You take one step, and then you go, <gasps> and then you take another step. And the equivalent for me is One Revolution, One Revolution of the Cranks. But the hope with One Revolution is that it becomes a revolution of one, that it becomes a revolution of all, that one little thing can lead to something big. We estimated it took 528,000 turns to the crank, 528,000 revolutions to make it to the top. A lot of little things to add up to that one big thing. It's the only way that I made it to camp. And I'm literally, I am 30 feet away from camp at this point, and I don't think I can make it. And the guys are setting up the camp and stuff like that. And I think this is what it must feel like to drown, to drown within sight of shore. Because I was so physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted that I didn't think I could make it. But that one revolution, that was the only way. It was just one. Just one. Just one. And I make it to camp. Now the reward of making it to camp is that I have the most excruciating 2,000 more feet left on the mountain. That is my reward for making it to camp. But the problem is that how often do we look just at, the, at what we have left to do and we miss, this is the shadow of Kilimanjaro over Mwansi, the sister mountain, and down into the valley 11,500 feet below. I have 2,000 more feet to go, but I've already gone 11,500 feet. We've got to celebrate these minor victories, don't we? Because sometimes that's the only thing that gives us the motivation to start again. Those minor victories. And the minor defeats. You know what? When I thought, when I went to the scouting trip, I thought we were just going to roll up to the top. I learned more from not making it up on that scouting trip than I would have if we'd just rolled to the top. More about myself, more about the vehicle, more about my training, more about what I could do as a person. We've got to learn from these minor victories and minor defeats because that's the only thing that allows us to move forward. Now Dave, my guide, took the sailing winch. He ran back down to Kibo Hut. He fixed the sailing winch. He ran back up. He met us for daylight. And it worked. And it was ridiculously painful. Now, have you ever heard anybody tell you, don't live life in the past. Don't live life in the future. Like, live for the moment. Like, be present. I was trying to do whatever I could to avoid the present. <laughs> trying to distract myself. I'm just going to count to 100 revolutions, and then I get to stop. I never made it to 100. So then I, I recalibrate and say, OK, well, let's go to 20. And then let's go to that rock. I'm going to go to that rock right there. Now, Bob, this guy who was my fraternity brother, who's the chair of my board, I thought he was trying to be helpful, but it turns out he was trying to be annoying. And he was doing a really good job of it. He kept coming up to me and saying, slow and steady wins the race. It's like, dude, really? You have any idea how hard I'm trying to achieve slow and steady? I am really trying to achieve slow and steady because it is ridiculously steep. Now... If I'm going to draw the attention that I need to draw, I need to do this under my own power. Like to be the first one to get to the top of Kilimanjaro in a hand cycle unassisted. And in some way, in my mind, that might be like Hillary getting to the top of Everest. It might be like Bannister breaking the four minute mile. It might force people to look at things differently. I mean, people thought that if you ran a sub four minute mile that your heart and lungs were going to explode. Now high schoolers do it, right? And the thing is, he was the guy who broke through, and I thought that maybe we could do that, but I had to do it under my own power because it wouldn't be nearly as impressive if somebody carried me to the top. And the problem was we reached this point at the crater rim. 18,500 feet, Gilman's Point, and I can't get over these boulders. So my crew and the porters, they carry me. They carry me for like 100 feet. 100 feet of the 13,000 feet that we climb which is a really small part of it, right? The 13,000. But to me, that meant that I didn't break the record. It meant that I didn't do it unassisted. It meant that I failed, and I felt like I failed my team, my team who struggled and sacrificed so much for two years just to give me the opportunity to try to climb the mountain, to try to affect this change, that I failed the 1.1 billion people in the world whose lives I was trying to affect. And so we dumped down into the crater Dormant volcano. We go through the, vol go through the crater. 
And as we're going along, I am crushed. I'm crushed because I feel like I've put so much into this thing and that we're not going to get anything out of it. And I'm also really, really mad. And I'm pedaling along and I keep thinking, looping through my head, I'm like, I've got to talk to Dave. Now Dave is my guy. Dave is the guy who developed this vehicle, who built the vehicle, who ran up and down this mountain four or five times to scout out to find the best route for me. And finally we got a quiet moment and I took Dave aside and I said, Dave, you disappointed me. You let me lie to all these people. You let me tell them that I could do this unassisted and you knew those boulders were there. You knew I couldn't do it. And Dave guides throughout the world and he said, Nobody climbs a mountain alone. Everybody does it as part of a team. So this is that epiphany moment, that light bulb moment for me where I go, oh, right, so you mean I started with this altruistic goal that I wanted to affect the lives of 1.1 billion people, but it's actually my journey? And this is the lesson that I'm supposed to learn, that I'm trying to minimize the feeling of being separate, but yet if I climb the mountain all by myself, then I don't need anybody. And if I don't need anybody, then I'm separate, then I'm alone. So we pedal along, and make it to camp and I make peace with it as we're going along. I think this is what I'm supposed to learn. This is why you do something that's this difficult because you're supposed to learn these lessons in absolute terms. And I pet along and I go straight from my, go from, straight from my sleeping bag in the tent. Dave goes off and contemplates the world. Does not jump, which is good. He comes back and he comes to the tent and I say, Dave, you know what? That was the lesson that I was supposed to learn. That's the reason that we were supposed to do this. And the next morning we wake up and Seki, who's our head African guy, the guy in the red here, I asked Seki because if you could see like over here, you'd see the two posts with signs at the top. And they're, they're literally, we can see them from camp that say this is the tallest mountain in Africa, 19,340 feet, Uhuru Peak, the roof of Africa. And I asked Seki, how long will it take me to get there? And Seki speaks English really well and he sort of strokes his chin and tilts his head and says, I think it'll take four hours. Now I think I mentioned that I'm slightly competitive, right? At this point, I'd lost the concept of the summit of the mountain. Seki said four hours and I said, you know what? Four hours, four days, four years, I'm just going to keep pedaling and I hope that I run into it at some point. Now, when I was a competitive athlete, the goal was always the top step of the podium. If I made it to the top step of the podium, it made all the work worthwhile. The problem is if that's the only thing that makes all the work worthwhile, then that each victory becomes more and more fleeting. When I retired, a friend of mine asked me, what do you miss about being a competitive athlete? And I thought about it a little bit. And so I was a ski racer and a wheelchair racer, and in between seasons, I would go and I'd do two-a-days. I'd do my volume work for the wheelchair racing season, which is like running. So I'd get up in the morning and I'd go do 20 miles in the morning. And then I'd take a nap and, you know, eat and shower and take a nap and read a little and then go out and do 20 miles in the afternoon. And she looked at me like I was a complete idiot. Like, really? That's what you miss? And I said, yes, because that's when the change happens. That's when the metamorphosis happens. When you're in season, all you can hope to do is perform the way you prepared. But in that early season, you can dream. And the thing was, when Seki said four hours, I said, you know what? Four hours, four days, four years, because the only thing that's guaranteed to me, the summit is not guaranteed to me, the only thing that's guaranteed is that journey. And I'd better enjoy that journey because that's the only thing that's guaranteed. I did hope that it would get easier it wasn't. We're still on the boards. I so just longed for that moment when I could just pedal and just let my mind wander, but I'm, I'm thinking actively the whole time, which is really hard when you're at like 40% of, 48% of oxygen. Then my mind is not working quite as well as it should. We're still on the boards. We're going along. Now, remember I said that we would revisit that little skull cap of snow. It's now stories high. The clouds are billowing out of the crater. It's like going along a pasture, like riding a bike along a pasture with horses. And what do they do? They come up to the rail to meet you. So in my altitude addled mind, I'm going along the trail and thinking, oh, the clouds are like horses. They're coming up to the trail to meet us as we're going along. Yes, this is what happens at altitude. Now, I mentioned that we did a documentary film on this and my crew 
is set up on a little ridge just in front of us. And Seki, the most strategic guy in the climb, is directly behind me because he figures that I'm going to be on camera. And if he's directly behind me, he's going to be on camera. <laughs> so Seki's directly behind me, and I, say, and I ask him when I see the crew, Seki, will I be able to see the summit from there? And he doesn't even need to stroke his chin on this one. He said, oh yeah, you'll be able to see the summit. I do not ask the follow-up question of how far will it be. It's literally 300 yards. For the first time in three days, I shift briefly out of first gear, dips a little bit, and then I shift back into first gear. Now you think if you climb a 19,000 foot mountain that you have flag at the ready to go stake into the heart of this mountain and say, I conquered this mountain. It wasn't the case for me at all. It was one of the most humbling feelings I've ever had. And then I'm pedaling along and I'm thinking, thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to make it to the top. Thank you for teaching me the things that I needed to learn along the way, that I needed two years of preparation just to have the opportunity to climb the mountain, that I needed to have a goal that was bigger than me myself because that was going to make me more powerful, that I needed to that it was the, the, the little things could actually add up to something big, that I needed to celebrate the minor victories and the minor defeats, that nobody climbs a mountain alone, and that the only thing that was guaranteed was the journey. There was a practical side. I think I mentioned that we put a fair amount of the film on my personal credit cards which I realize there are some bankers here who are going, no, no, don't do that. That's not a good idea. That's bad, bad, yes. Yes, it was a bad idea. Yeah, the, the months seemed to be like three days long. It was amazing. It was the end of the month. It, every three days, it seemed like. And I was, it, was, it was awful. And, and so at this point, yes, there's a practical side where I'm thinking, I need the media to tell our story, and I don't know if they're going to tell our story. I need the media to tell our story so I can get out of personal bankruptcy, impending personal bankruptcy. I want them to do this, and the problem was I didn't know what they were going to say about me getting carried for 100 feet. I didn't know what they were going to say, but then I looked at Tajiri, who was a porter on the mountain. He was up early one morning carrying the gear well before we ever met him, and there was a rock slide. It was a rock slide that killed three people who were still asleep in their tents. It literally ripped Tajiri's leg off of his body. Now in developing countries, they often believe that a physical disability means that God is punishing you and your family, that you've done something worthy of punishment. And when we first met him, my producer on the film said, he should climb with us. It'd be so great to have an African, a former reporter, reconnecting with the mountain. And I said, I don't think he can do it. But they, but, but they impressed upon me that we should help him out. So we bought him a new prosthesis, one that was lighter, one that fit him better. He went out and he trained. And What's that? My phone. Oh, is my phone ringing? Eh. I don't think it's ringing, but hey, I'll turn it off. Okay, so nobody call me now. <laughs> so anyway, the, where was I? Uh, so anyway, she said he should climb with us. It'd be so great to have an African reform reporter reconnecting with the mountain. We bought him a prosthesis, a new one. He went out and he trained in the first day back on the mountain. He said to the other porters, he said, you never thought you'd see me here again. Well, I'm back. And this guy had been a hollow shell of a guy who was back. He was complete. So I'm worried about the media, but this guy became an example that God wasn't punishing him and his family. That's the example of it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you, which is exactly where we started, right? Joseph Campbell once wrote, I don't think that people are searching so much for the meaning of life as they are the experience of being alive. And what is the experience of being alive? The experience of being alive is, is everything that goes right and everything that goes wrong. It's euphoria, it's heartache, and somehow finding a way to take that next step to make it to the top of the mountain. So thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. I think we do have some time for some questions, though, too, if we want to do that. Do you want to do that? I mean, you can clap now, too. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to stop you from that. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, if you can. Thank you so much. Thanks for the standing O back there. Thank you guys for joining us, too. They told me a little bit about your program. That's awesome. Uh, okay. Oops, Peter, we have our first one right there. <laughs> We're 
we're waiting for it to warm up. Do we get that on the? Uh, can we can we change? Do we have one more channel? Wait, we're, okay, we're working on it. Working on it. These are the guys who have the toughest job in the house, that's for sure. And they've done a tremendous job of making sure that all the AV stuff works. I mean, not a job I want. That one is hard. We should be on. So the question is. Okay, the question is, yes. How many days did it take you to go all the way up the mountain? How many days did it take me to go all the way up the mountain? It took six and a half days to get up the mountain. It took a day and a half to get down the mountain. But it took two years to get to the mountain. So I kept saying that the two weeks that I was on the mountain were the easiest two weeks that I had in three years. Because all I had to do was pedal for nine hours a day. I didn't have to pay any bills, I didn't have to raise any money, I didn't have to manage anybody. All I had to do was pedal for nine hours a day and that was really easy by comparison. <laughs> Are we good now? Do we Another have question, we have the microphone too. How can we see the documentary that was made during the trek? How do you, how do you find it? Yes. Okay, uh, one of the ways you can do it is you can go to our website, which is www.onerevolution, so O-N-E hyphen revolution, dot com or dot org, both work. Uh, and, and there's a link to the film there. We can send you a DVD, which and to me is kind of nice to actually have the DVD. I think I have a few of them here. Let me see if I do that. I think I do have a few of them here as well. And, and it's on iTunes as well, which is the number one revolution. We made a marketing choice there and changed the name so that we'd be at the top of the scroll. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed really strategic. I kind of wish we hadn't done it though. Oh, Peter, we have one down here. Oops, or we have one there. I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you your business. You're in charge. It's your house, good point. Where were you when you had your skiing accident? Where was it when I had my skiing accident? I was at a place called Berkshire East, which is in Charlemont, Massachusetts, about 45 minutes from where I grew up in western Massachusetts and Granby, Massachusetts. So, so a place called Charlemont, or Berkshire East. So I think there was one up here somewhere. No? Okay, there we go. Was it fun going down the mountain or did you have to pedal? Was it fun going up the mountain or down the mountain or which one? Down. down. Was going down fun? You know, it was fun, and this won't make any sense to you, but maybe you can ask your parents about this, but sometimes you get to an age where going up is actually more fun than going down. I don't know if that makes any sense. On the way down, we, so the vehicle weighed a little bit over 60 pounds. And, and it would articulate, but we didn't add any suspension because suspension would have added more weight. So we were trying to keep it as light as we could. So going down, I felt like, you now you pick the dandelion and you pop the top off of it. That's how I felt when I was going down, like my head was gonna pop off. <laughs> so going down was, was painful. Okay, um, when you were going down, like in the trouble spots you had going up, did, did, did I have trouble spots going, going down, is that the question? No, did you have trouble going down? Did I have trouble going down? Yeah, I mean, down was, down was a, a real challenge. And, and so like that scree field that you saw, it took me two and a half days to go up that scree field. It took 15 minutes to go down. So that was relatively easy. But a lot of the other things, those rock gardens, those baby heads, there were times that I was going at walking pace and Seki, our head African guide, was back there talking in Swahili to some other, uh, one of the other guides. And I felt like it sounded like they were sharing recipes. It was like this uh, Swahili sewing circle behind me. And it was so annoying. I just wanted to drop them. I wanted to leave them. You know, they're like, oh, but if you put saffron in it, it'd be great. <laughs> Which saffron's a great, great spice. I'm a big fan. But, but yeah, but I, and I couldn't get away from them. So there were definitely times going down <laughs> that I was thinking, oh, this is really hard. <laughs> um, were you, was your arms really sore after <laughs> you? My arms were really sore. It was funny though, when I was on the mountain, it wasn't like I woke up every day thinking, I can't get out of bed. I felt pretty normal pretty much every day, but by the time we got down off the mountain, returned to the hotel, I couldn't get out of the shower. 
and I couldn't get out of bed. So I was really tired and really sore. I, could, I, just, I couldn't get enough sleep. It was amazing. But when I was on the mountain, it was like, okay, here we go. This is the assignment. This is what we do. It's my job. Get up and pedal for nine hours. Anybody else? Oh, I must know. say, when we had the children here, their hands were popping left and right. We have too many adults in the room, I think. I don't know. All right, Dan. I think that might be it. Though the children didn't have to, they, were, they had to go back to class if they didn't ask questions, right? So. <laughs> so when you completed this amazing feat, at what point did you say, what's next? What do I do with this? I mean, what, what, what possibly can I do next? And take this and build the momentum, because that's not something you can go do every year. Or, you know, I'm not going go to go to Everest next year. You have to take that and... It's humbling almost to go, what can I do next? What can I do to, to, to take this to another level in another way? It's, it's a great question because with, with a mission of turning perception of disability upside down, you're never really done. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what's next? You, you sound a bit like Bob, though. I came off the mountain and Bob said, so what's next? And I was like, a shower, really? <laughs> That's what's next now. But, but there has to be another challenge. and, and and it's interesting because the, the physical challenge in a lot of ways is what the accident, the physical side is what the accident took away from me. So for me, skiing, when I got back to skiing, that was representative of my recovery. When I started skiing again and when I started skiing well, I felt like that meant that I had really recovered. I think my, for my father, the guy who said I needed just to get a job and he wouldn't have to worry about me, he put up the film for the family over July 4th, I think this was 2011, put up the film for the family and he watched the film the afternoon before putting it up again. And I, ha I still have to ask him this question because for him, I think that was representative of my recovery, which was like 20 something years after my recovery. But, uh, but what's next? And so the physical side of it, we did last year, we did a bike ride down from Seattle down to San Diego which is pretty good. We're talking about doing a cross-country one where we're going to stop and do these presentations along the way. So ride, talk, ride, talk. Hopefully get the kids to join us at some point. Uh, but, but yeah, the, there are a whole bunch of other ones. And the beauty of the mountain as, as a metaphor for all of our challenges is that, that it's not necessarily always physical. So I have a children's book that's coming out this year on the climb, celebrating our five-year anniversary, which is awesome which was way more challenging in some ways than climbing the mountain. And I'm still working on my memoir, which has actually been the most challenging of the thing, trying to turn my life into story because the hope is that, the hope, and this has been the biggest challenge in writing that story, is trying to achieve an honest enough voice that you can put yourself in the position of the protagonist. Because if I give you a process story, you go, okay, that's good, but it's not about me. And so really the hope with the book, which is the biggest challenge, is to re achieve that level of honesty where I don't always know what's going on. And that's actually probably more frequent than not. But, uh, but that's, that's the next really big challenge for me and, and hopefully one that's sort of not a lifetime, but a lifetime challenge in that I hope that there are more stories that follow it. So. I think there's one Anymore? on the far side and then... This up. There's one over there. All right. That's two. Here we go. Sarah Mason. And then I'm What are you afraid of? What am I afraid of? Wow. See, this is why we go to the schools and talk to the kids. Because I don't know if any of you adults could ask that question, right? I mean, you might be thinking it, but you can't ask it. And this is why we do this, because, because it's so cool that the kids' minds are so open and they're not bound by political correctness that they, they want to ask a question and they want to get an answer, which I haven't given you yet, obviously. I'm vamping at this point. <laughs> but but, uh, but that, that, to me, is what's so cool about this. And so what am I afraid of? A lot of things. I think I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of failure even though we talked so much about that today, in it, that, that failure to me is something that, that we've got to embrace. I have, a, I have a note card that's on my mirror that's in front of my roller where I train in, indoors for my, for my uh, racing chair. And on the note card it says, run toward your fear. And, and oftentimes I think our fear is so much more profound when it's in our head. 
and running toward our fear, it targets that fear. And it doesn't seem nearly as intimidating when we target that fear. But, but I have to remember that stuff. And I think fear is a, an amazing motivator for us. But yeah, I, I fear failure. I, feel, I fear not, not reaching my potential. I fear being alone. I fear, uh, you know, I, I fear, I, I think a lot of things. And I think that in some ways, fear can be debilitating or fear can be motivating. And, and generally, it's a pretty motivating thing for me in that I realize that fear can be irrational too. So I hope that's an answer to your question. Yeah, okay, good. Last question, Chris. Last question, okay, good. How long after you had your accident did you have this positive attitude? <laughs> How long after the, after the accident did I have this positive attitude? A funny thing happened to me in the, in the hospital, I think, in that I was so scared, and we talked about this today during the presentation, that what had happened to me was going to make me separate from all of my, from my friends and family, from the people I loved. And that's what I worried most about, that I was going to be alone when I was lying in my, in my hospital bed. But then people would come in to visit me, and they'd come in to, to cheer me up. And, they, and I could see the pain of responsibility on their face when they came in, on their faces when they came in. Because they're looking at me and they're thinking, I've got to make everything better. How can I make everything better? And they knew that they couldn't make everything better. And so for me, the guy lying in the hospital bed with the tubes coming in and out of my body or whatever, you know, I'm lying there and I had to put them at ease because otherwise I risked that great fear of mine of being alone. And I think that the positive attitude in a lot of ways came from having that power of being able to put them at ease. That they came in and I needed to put them at ease. And I made them comfortable. And in that, I gained a lot of power. And I gained the power in saying, you know what? It's going to be all right. I promise you it'll be all right. I didn't know how it would be all right, but I promise you it'll be all right. And, and that was it. And I was lucky that I had a tremendous amount of support from friends and family. And I was also lucky that, and this is for all you, all you parents out there, that the greatest gift that my mother and father gave to my brother and me was the opportunity to fail, the opportunity to make mistakes. And that didn't change after my accident as much as they wanted to, as much as they wanted to say, no, 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 let's wrap you in bubble wrap and we'll keep it all good and everything will be fine. They gave me that opportunity to go out and fail and to fail, to fail gloriously. One of my favorite quotes, and maybe I'll just end with this. I'll end, I'll end with, this, uh, with this Teddy Roosevelt quote. And you guys have, have heard this, I'm sure. It's, uh, he said, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or how the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, for there is no effort without error or a shortcoming, but who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotions, who spends himself for a worthy cause, who in the end, at best, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, fails while daring greatly. So this place will never be among those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. And that quote hangs next to my computer. So when I start having those questions, that's the quote that I look to and say, that's the person that I want to be. So thank you very much for letting me share an evening with you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Chris, thank we... Uh, we thank you for your insight, your story, your inspiration. Um, I know that each and every one of us are walking away uh, with something that we can help make our lives better, which will then result in making other lives better. So we greatly, greatly appreciate it. We do have some parting gifts. Oh, very nice. Now, um, Chris is going to be experiencing his first FSU football game. Ah. And <laughs> So we have two hats for him to wear while he is here in Tallahassee. Um, one, of course, would be Holy Comfort Episcopal School, of course. There we go. 
And it fits. Then we also have some garnet and gold. So. Oh, very nice. Okay. One, one last round of applause for Chris Waddell. I'd imagine one works with the whole crowd, and the other maybe not quite as much. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you all for being here. On February 12th, we will continue our lecture series where we have a preview of our legislature. So we invite you back on February 12th. Please mark your calendar. And thank you so much for being here. Have a great rest of the evening.